Um, so welcome everyone to uh, the first meeting of our uh, spring semester of the Center for Global Ethics and Politics. I'm Professor Carol Gould and direct the center. And my assistant, Alice Roberts, is here to um, co-host. Uh, I'm really delighted to um, be hosting today uh, the Arthur Zittrain prof uh, Professor of Bioethics. Is that it? What's the exact title? I know That's correct. Doing. That's correct. Our chair, Chair of Bioethics and Director of the Center for Bioethics and a professor of global public health and an affiliated professor in the Department of Philosophy at NYU. And um, uh, Matthew is the author of, of uh, several uh, works, especially the very noteworthy and provocative, The Right to be Loved. Um, and he's also been at the forefront of um, pushing the boundaries of applied ethics and of bioethics with his work on moral brains, the neuroscience of morality, and current controversies in bioethics, another book that he uh, edited, and uh, most recently an edited collection called The Ethics of Artificial Intelligence. So we're going to be benefiting from that here. And uh, closest to my heart is his collection, The Philosophical Foundations of Human Rights, which I was privileged to contribute to. And he and I um, agree certainly on the, um, the suggestiveness and the importance of a human rights framework um, and, its, and its variety of applications, one of which we're gonna be hearing today. So I'm really excited uh, to be welcoming you. I mean, just before we start, before I um, pass the uh, imaginary mic to uh, Matthew Lau, uh, I want to mention that our next speaker will be in person. It is Professor Jose Medina of Northwestern University, who will be giving the uh, Mark Swartovsky uh, Memorial Lecture, and we are co-sponsoring at the center. And his title is Protest Silencing and Epistemic Activism, and that will be on March 9th. Um, and then additionally, we have Beth Kahn talking, uh, coming to us from Durham in the UK online. Um, and she's also talking about protests and um, in a global justice context. Um, and she will be um, March 25th. And then uh, finally, we will have Carol Hay on thinking like an intersectional feminist. Uh, which will be important also for global ethics, if you ask me, but even if it's not right on the topic. Um, so uh, with that said, I would like to um, ask Matthew to give us his talk, which is entitled Ethics of AI and Healthcare Towards a Substantive Human Rights Framework. Matthew, thank you for coming. Yeah, so thank you very much, Carol, for that very wonder, uh, warm welcome. I just want to mention that Professor Held was also in the volume on the Philosophical Foundations. Ah, the yes, right. Yes, <laughs> and uh, which we're really honored to have her. Um, and so let me, I'm going to try to share my screen. So let me try to do this. Uh, let's see. Without sharing my email. Can everybody see this? Yes, yes, it looks great. Okay, so we'll get started. Okay, so there's enormous interest in using AI in healthcare contexts. AI applications have begun to diagnose some types of cancer better than doctors, identify heart rhythm abnormalities like cardiologists, diagnose various eye diseases as well as ophthalmologists, and identify viable embryos as fertility specialists do. But before AI can be used in clinical settings, we need to make sure that companies and AI researchers follow appropriate ethical frameworks and guidelines when developing these technologies. And in recent years, uh, there have been a great number of ethical frameworks for AI. So to date, for example, there are over 80 such frameworks from private um, companies, governmental agencies, academic and research institutions, and so on. Now, these research frameworks have some recommendations in common. Uh, so for instance, many draw on the four principles of biomedical ethics, uh, autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice. 
So among other things, autonomy seeks to ensure that patients and consumers are fully informed of and understand the risk and benefits of a particular AI health technology and voluntarily consent to it. Beneficence aims to guarantee that AI health applications promote the well-being of patients and society as a whole. Non-maleficence strives to ensure that AI health technologies do not impose undue bur uh, harm on patients. And justice seeks to promote fair, uh, the fair and equitable distribution of benefits and burdens of health, AI health technologies among individuals and society. And in addition to these four principles, many frameworks also list uh, recommendations such as transparency, uh, explicability and trust, given that some forms of AI are not understood easily. And I'm gonna come back to this point uh, in a minute. Now, at the same time, many organizations offer their own distinct recommendations. So here's one from the Future of Life Institute. And uh, among other things, it lists value alignment. And that basically says that highly autonomous AI systems should be designed so that their goals and behaviors are aligned with human values. Um, or Microsoft recommends inclusiveness. And that says that AI systems should empower uh, everyone and engage people. Now, in one sense, it's great that these organizations are, were concerned enough with the ethical design and use of AI to put forward these frameworks and guidelines. But in, an, in another sense, however, uh, this proliferation of ethical framework has created confusion. Um, how were these particular sets of recommendations developed and not others? Which recommendation should AI developers and organizations follow and why? More fundamentally, what grounds and justifies these recommendations? How do we distinguish between uh, recommendations that are genuine ethical uh, principles from those that are not? And more importantly, how does one use these recommendations in practice? So for instance, it seems reasonable that we should not impose undue harm on patients, but how do we actually do this? Likewise, it seems reasonable that we should be able to trust an AI system, but how do we decide which AI systems to trust? Now, unfortunately, most of these AI ethics frameworks have been silent on these questions. And as a result, they have been criticized for offering abstract high level principles that in practice have uh, provided few concrete guidance. And some people have expressed concern that these firm frameworks are merely forms of ethics washing and virtue signaling where organizations and companies are exaggerating their interest in ethical AI as public relations exercise and maybe to forestall governmental regulation. So to staff off such accusations, we therefore need an AI ethics framework that is grounded in substantive normative theory. One can, the one that can tell us whether a recommendation is a genuine ethical principle or not. So elsewhere, um, as Carol uh, has mentioned, I've developed what I call the fundamental conditions approach to human rights. And that says that human beings have human rights to the fundamental conditions for pursuing a good life. And I've applied this approach to some issues in uh, biomedical uh, ethics, as well as ethics of AI generally. It, so I'm gonna illustrate how this approach can, um, uh, in this talk, I'm gonna argue that this approach can be extended to the use of AI in healthcare. And I'm gonna illustrate how this approach can help us figure out uh, which recommendations are genuine ethical principles and I'm gonna also show how it can help companies and AI researchers identify uh, ethical considerations that they might encounter. So to develop this framework, let me first say something about what AI is and the current forms of AI, uh, how current forms of AI can give rise to ethical problems. <clears throat> So there's no agreed upon definition of AI. For our purpose, we can understand AI broadly as getting uh, machines to do things that when intelligent beings such as humans do them, um, they require cognitive functions such as thinking, learning, and problem solving. Now, AI can take many different forms. 
one form is uh, symbolic AI, which basically uses a series of explicitly programmed if then rules and statements to establish the relations between inputs and outputs. Another form of AI is machine learning. And this uses algorithms to learn from data without being ex explicitly programmed to do so. <clears throat> and within machine learning, you can distinguish between supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. So supervised learning is where an algorithm is trained on the data set where the correct answers for certain data are known and the data are labeled accordingly. And once the algorithm learns the relationship between the inputs and outputs, it can then apply what it has learned to predict the correct answer in a different target data set. In unsupervised learning, a given data set hasn't been labeled and an algorithm aims to sort the data on its own. And in re reinforcement learning, uh, a re reinforcement learning agent attempts to learn through experience. The algorithm rewards an agent if it succeeds a task or punishes the agent if it fails. And so basically through trial and error, the agent strives to maximize the long-term reward. And all these methods can be combined with uh, something called deep learning, which uses different layers of nodes to detect increasingly abstract features, which maximize information capture while minimizing losses in predictive accuracy. Now, as impressive as machine learning is, it also suffers from uh, certain limitations, which can give rise to a host of ethical issues. So first of all, uh, machine learning needs a lot of data to work well. For example, supervised learning algorithms can fine tune themselves and achieve great predictive uh, power when they have access to a vast amount of data. <clears throat> so consequently, this incentivizes companies and organizations to harvest or buy data, including sensitive personal data, even when doing so might violate an individual's right to privacy. So one example of this is when the Royal Free NHS Foundation Trust, so this is in the UK, provided personal data of about 1.6 million patients to Google DeepMind in 2017 um, to test a novel way of detecting kidney injuries, uh, but they didn't inform the patients about how their health data will be used. And another case is when uh, the drug maker, uh, GlaxoSmithKline, bought the exclusive rights to mine the genetic data of, uh, of customers of the DNA testing service 23andMe. Now, another problem with machine learning is that it's only as good as the data from which it learns. So this is basically the garbage in, garbage out problem. So if a machine learning algorithm is trained on inadequate or inaccurate data, then the algorithm is going to make bad predictions, even if itself is well designed. So, for instance, algorithms trained on gender imbalanced medical imaging data sets have been found to do worse at reading chest x rays for an uh, underrepresented gender. Similarly, there are reasons to be concerned that skin cancer detection algorithms may not do as well detecting skin cancer affecting people with dark skin because many of these algorithms are trained primarily on lighter skinned individuals. Now, thirdly, even if a machine learning algorithm <clears throat> receives uh, ac uh, adequate and accurate data, if the algorithm itself is bad, it's also gonna make bad predictions. So for instance, a bad uh, learning algorithm may identify a pattern even if there isn't one. So this is um, also known as overfitting, or it may fail to identify a pattern even when there is one. So that's the problem of underfitting. An algorithm may also give too much or too little weight to certain features or fail to include certain relevant features altogether. Um, and faulty algorithms can have serious ethical implications. So for example, an algorithm uh, used widely in US hospitals to determine which patients should get extra care was found to discriminate against black patients because it used health uh, costs as a proxy for health needs. And owing to structural inequalities, 
black patients often spend less on healthcare than white patients. And as a result, the algorithm falsely concluded that black patients were healthier than equally sick white patients. Or in 2016, the Arkansas uh, Department of uh, Human Services began to use alg algorithmic tools to determine how many hours of home care some people with disability should receive. And the algorithm caused many people to be hospitalized because it uh, had incorrectly coded conditions such as cerebral palsy and had not accounted for conditions such as diabetes. And fourthly, as I mentioned earlier, uh, deep learning is a black box that raises issues such as interpretability, explainability, and trust. So deep learning is basically impenetrable even to its programmers because it typically employs thousands or millions of connections that interact with one another in very complex ways. As a result, it's difficult to interpret what those interact, uh, interactions mean. And the issue of explainability arises because human beings often need to know how a decision is reached. And this could be a problem because, you know, uh, suppose that a deep learning algorithm predicts that there's a 70% chance that Jay's tumor will become malignant in five years. The algorithm does not, for example, say that, well, there's a 70% chance that Jay's tumor will become malignant because Jay has a history of cancer, is over 50 years old, and has lower back problems. Without such an explanation, the doctor would be unable to explain to Jay why his tumor is likely to become malignant. Beyond explainability, this also raises the issue of trust in the deep learning system, since we do not know whether it makes the predictions, uh, it makes its predictions on reasonable and reliable grounds. And for high stake decisions in healthcare, not being able to trust the deep learning system is especially problematic. So are there ways to address or mitigate deep learning, um, uh, deep learning's black box problem? Well, some AI researchers are currently exploring technical fixes such as interpret interpretable machine learning. So one such method involves adding to deep learning models an additional layer after the hidden layer of nodes and before the output. And so the added layer is intended to provide information such as which features were the most important for arriving at a particular prediction and so on and so forth. And the hope is that this information would make the deep learning system more interpretable. But there are a number uh, of problems with this approach. One is that since it's placed outside of uh, the black box, the additional layer provides a post hoc uh, explanation of the black box after it has already made its predictions. So one might wonder whether such a post hoc explanation would give us the actual reasons why a black box gave the predictions that it did. So the concern can be put in form of a dilemma. Either the predictions are based on the post hoc explanations or they're not. If they are not based on these explanations, what's the value of the explanations? They might just be some kind of post hoc rationalization that doesn't correspond to how the black box has arrived at its predictions. Now, suppose instead that the predictions are based on the post hoc explanations. Now, if so, presumably it should be possible to design a new model using just these, uh, use, uh, these post hoc explanations. But if this is the case, this implies that the black box is actually indispensable. And in fact, this suggests a way to test the value of these interpretable machine learning systems. If the black box remains indispensable for many, making predictions, this would suggest that the post hoc explanations have not given us all the relevant explanations of why it gave the predictions that it did. Now, other people have proposed that, well, perhaps we should care more about accuracy than interpretability in medicine. So take healthcare. Some people have said that clinicians also prescribe medications without fully understanding why these medications work. So for instance, it might be argued that aspirin prescribed, um, uh, it, it has been argued that aspirin has been prescribed for nearly a century 
without understanding the mechanism through which it works. But while we may not fully understand how medications work in many cases, we do have some ideas of the causal mechanisms through which they work. So, so for example, take aspirin. We, people knew that something from a willow causes fever and pain to be reduced, even if they did not know about salicylic acid, an active ingredient in the production of aspirin. This contrasts with the machine learning system, which works through associations and is at least for now unable to track causal relationships. And to see why this matters, um, it's helpful to point out that machine learning systems are vulnerable to a certain kind of adversarial attacks. So for instance, deep neural networks are vulnerable to, uh, to this uh, one pixel attack. So in one study, researchers were able to get the deep learning algorithm to classify an image of a ship as a car just by changing one pixel in an image. And the researchers found that such a one pixel attack is successful on nearly three quarters of standard uh, training images. And that altering even more pixels made this type of attack even more effective. So if a deep learning system can be vulnerable to one pixel attacks, can be, they be uh, even more vulnerable to multi-pixel attacks? In another study, uh, researchers made a 0.04% change to the pixel values in an Im input image. So about 400 pixels out of 1 million. These changes were imperceptible to the human eye, as you can see. Nevertheless, the deep neural network classified a panda as a given with 99.3% confidence. And re recently, researchers have shown that uh, adversarial attacks can also be done on medical machine learning. So the fact that deep learning networks are vulnerable to these types of attacks suggests that deep learning uh, networks are not, are not learning real features of the world, such as causal relations or what a ma macro object like a panda really is. Instead, they're just they're only learning superficial features. And for our purpose, if these networks can be tricked in these ways, issues of explainability and trust remain highly relevant, especially in high stakes uh, domains such as medicine where human beings could be harmed. So in sum, given all the ways that a machine learning uh, system could fail, it's critical that companies and AI researchers have an appropriate ethical framework that they can follow when developing these technologies. So now I'm gonna say a bit about the fundamental conditions approach by explaining why I think human beings have the human rights to the fundamental conditions for pursuing a good life. So the fundamental conditions for pursuing a good life are, as I understand it, um, uh, various uh, goods, capacities, and options that human beings, qua human beings need, whatever else they qua individuals might need in order to pursue the basic activities. And the fundamental goods are resources that human beings, qua human beings need in order to sustain themselves corporally, including food, water, and air. The fundamental capacities are powers and abilities that human beings uh, need in order to uh, pursue the basic activities. And these, activity, capaci uh, these capacities include things like the capacity to think, to be motivated by facts, to choose an act freely, so liberty, to appreciate the worth of something, to develop interpersonal relationships, and to have control of the direction of one's life. And the fundamental options are those social forms and institutions that human beings need if they are able to exercise their essential capacities. And by basic activities, I mean, you know, uh, sort, sort of things, uh, um, uh, things such as deep personal relationships, uh, knowledge of the workings of the world, uh, active pleasures such as creative work and play, and passive pleasures such as appreciating beauty. Now, these fundamental conditions uh, ground human rights in my view, because having these fundamental conditions is of fundamental importance to human beings, and because rights can offer powerful protection to those who possess them. And the former is true because if anything is of fundamental importance to human beings, 
than pursuing a characteristically good human life is. And it seems clear that if we attach a certain importance to an end, we should attach this importance to the essential means to this end. And so since pursuing a good life is of fundamental importance to human beings, having the fundamental conditions for pursuing a good life must also be of fundamental importance to human beings. And that rights can offer powerful protection to those who possess them as well now. By their nature, rights secure the interests of the right holders by requiring others, the duty bearers, to perform certain services for them or not to interfere with the right holders' pursuit of their essential interests. And in addition, on a certain structural accounts of rights, rights typically prevent the right holders' interests that ground rights from uh, being part of a first order utilitarian calculus. And this means that if a right holder has a right to something, then typically no non-right claims can override the right holder's right to that thing. Finally, as some writers have pointed out, because the right holders are entitled, these, uh, to, entitled to these services as a matter of rights, this means that the right holder can simply expect these services without requesting them. So given the strong protections that rights can offer uh, for the rights holders, and given the importance of having these fundamental conditions to human beings, it seems reasonable uh, that human beings have human rights to these fundamental conditions. So if this is correct, this gives us, this explains why human beings have human rights to the fundamental conditions for pursuing a good life. So I think this fundamental conditions approach can explain why many of the recommendations found in various AI ethics frameworks are genuine ethical principles. Uh, so for instance, take autonomy found in many such frameworks, which requires that patients be fully informed of and understand the risks and benefits of a particular AI health application and that they voluntarily consent to it. The fundamental conditions approach can readily explain and justify this principle. So as noted earlier, autonomy understood as being able to control the direction of one's life is one of the fundamental conditions. To be able to control the direction of one's life in the context of AI healthcare, one needs to be informed of and understand the risks and benefits of a particular AI health application. So the fundamental conditions approach therefore implies that patients have a right to have sufficient information and the time to decide whether uh, to use a particular health application or not. Likewise, take non-maleficence, which um, uh, seeks to ensure that AI health applications do not impose undue harm on the patients. Again, the fundamental conditions approach can readily and justify such a principle. If patients were to experience harm when using a particular AI health application, this would undermine their ability to pursue the basic activities. So the fundamental conditions approach implies that patients have a right not to have such harm imposed on them unnecessarily, which means that companies and AI researchers should do whatever they can to minimize the risks of harm to patients. However, the fundamental conditions approach would also exclude some recommendations as genuine ethical principles. So to use an example, take value alignment, which says again that highly autonomous AI systems should be designed so that their goals and behaviors are aligned with human values. Now, many people endorse this recommendation because they're concerned that AI systems are soon gonna outpace humans. And they want to ensure that algorithms are designed in such a way that will, uh, uh, such that they won't harm humanity. But while this is a laudable goal, it's not clear that AI systems should be designed so that their goals and behaviors align with human values. Given that human values vary quite widely and only some of them are good. So while many people uh, would regard Mother Teresa as a moral exemplar, there are others who would not and would instead regard autocratic dictators and racists as moral exemplars. And it seems clear that AI systems should not be designed so that their goals and behaviors are aligned with the values of those who prefer autocrats and or racists. So a more plausible principle in the vicinity 
is that AI system should be designed so that their goals and behaviors respect persons or humanity as ends in themselves. The fundamental conditions approach can explain why this would be a genuine ethical principle on the grounds that having our moral status as persons respected is a fundamental condition for pursuing the basic activities. Indeed, if our moral status as persons were not respected, then others would be at liberty to use uh, us as a mere means to their own end. If so, we would not have the kind of control necessary to determine, to, to determine the direction of our lives. In any case, this shows that the fundamental conditions approach can be used to distinguish genuine ethical principles and those that are not. So I think the fundamental conditions approach doesn't just give us a substantive ethical framework for determining which recommendations are genuine from those that are not. Um, as a, I'm now gonna illustrate, it also offers AI researchers and uh, companies in healthcare a helpful framework for identifying distinct ethical considerations that they might encounter and for explaining and justifying uh, these ethical considerations. So to illustrate, in healthcare, there's a spectrum in which healthcare algorithms can be deployed, ranging from inside the human organism to outside of it. So the former might include a smart pill injected into the body to monitor uh, vital signs, while the latter might involve processing data from an Im imaging device that detects skin cancer. And the fact that a particular healthcare algorithm will be placed inside a human organism can raise distinct ethical concerns. So here's one. Such an algorithm can directly and negatively impact a human being's uh, basic health. So basic health, as I understand it, is the adequate functioning of the various parts of our organism that are needed for the development and exercise of the fundamental capacities, such for example, the capacity to think. And so various life processes such as respiration, digestion, metabolism, and so on, and various organ systems, the nervous system, the skeletal system, the cardiovascular system, make up and enable and, sus uh, and sustain these fundamental capacities. These parts of our organism must function adequately for us to develop and exercise our fundamental capacities. And it should be clear that algorithms that operate inside the human organism can directly and negatively impact our important life processes. Uh, indeed, a smart pill inside one's body could deliver the wrong drugs, or deliver the right drugs, but at the wrong time, thereby disrupting and possibly damaging various life processes. And for our purpose, the fundamental conditions approach can uh, explain why basic health is an ethical consideration uh, that we should take seriously. Basic health is something that human beings, qua human beings need, whatever else they qua individuals might need in order to pursue a good life. Indeed, without basic health, human beings would not possess the fundamental capacities and without the fundamental capacities, they would not be able to pursue a good life. As such, basic health is a fundamental conditions for pursuing a good life. And earlier we said that human beings have human rights to the fundamental conditions for pursuing a good life. So it follows that human beings have a human right to basic health. Hence, the fundamental conditions approach tells us to take basic health seriously because it's a human right. And that human beings have this right means that they have a right not to be ex exposed to an undue risk of something such as an AI uh, healthcare algorithm that can negatively impact their basic health. Here's another consideration. To get healthcare algorithms to operate inside a human organism, we would need to put them inside somebody's body. But uh, bodily integrity is also a fundamental condition for pursuing a good life because without control over one's body, a human being would not be able to pursue a good life. So on the fundamental conditions approach, we also have a human right to bodily integrity. The fundamental conditions approach offers another reason why we should be more cautious when deploying healthcare algorithms inside a human body, namely because there's the potential to undermine somebody else's, somebody's right to bodily integrity. To give another example, 
of how the fundamental conditions approach can help identify distinct ethical issues uh, that AI researchers in healthcare might encounter, there's another spectrum in which healthcare algorithms can be deployed, ranging from those designed to assist human beings with their decision-making to those capable of making decisions on their own. So an example of the former might be algorithms that can recommend potential medical diagnosis. Physicians can then elect to incorporate these algorith algorithmic diagnosis into their decisions about how to treat patients. An example of the latter might be a robot surgeon designed to make incisions and perform surgery without any human input or control. So with respect to healthcare algorithms that enhance but not replace human decision-making, we remain in control of how they are used. This means that we can choose not to use these algorithms if doing so happens not to align with our preferences, or if we believe that doing so could cause harm and violate the rights of others. But with respect to algorithms that make their own decisions independently, we may no longer be fully in control of them once they're deployed. Among other things, this can result in these algorithms inadvertently going against our preferences and values and exposing others to harm without our being able to stop them. The fundamental conditions approach implies that the algorithms that can operate autonomous, uh, autonomously would require distinct scrutiny since they could inadvertently subject others to harm and violate the rights of others without our inputs. So interestingly, healthcare algorithms could, could be deployed on both spectrums at the same time. Uh, so resulting in at least four types of combined algorithms. So in type one, you have algorithms that operate uh, uh, inside a human organism and make their own decisions. Type two, you have algorithms that operate outside a human organism, but make their own decisions. Type three, you have algorithms that operate inside a human organism, but they just serve as inputs into human decision-making. And type four, you have algorithms that operate outside a human organism, and that serves as inputs in human decisions. And so some examples of type one might be next generation brain computer interfaces, so BCIs or smart pills, both of which would operate inside a human organism and be able to make independent decisions without human input. Uh, and some examples of type two might include next generation robot surgeons or robot caretakers both of which would operate outside a human organism, but could make decisions on their own without human input. An example of type three might be AI powered in vivo biosensors that can continuously monitor biological processes inside a human organism and provide this information uh, to physicians for further analysis. And an example of type four might be AI-enabled radiology assistance, which can improve diagnostic accuracy. Now for our purpose, the fundamental conditions approach can help us see that ethical considerations we have identified earlier could remain even when the algorithms are deployed on both, both spectrums. So to give an example, Take a next generation BCI that would operate inside a human organism and be able to make independent decisions without human input. The fundamental conditions approach tells us that we should make sure that such a device would not violate uh, the, the right to basic health and the right to bodily integrity, and also that it should not inadvertently cause harm to others. So I'm now gonna show that being able to identify the kinds of ethical considerations that one might encounter with respect to a particular healthcare or algorithm can help us decide how it should be developed and implemented. So as we have seen a pressing problem with current uh, versions of deep learning systems is that their learning is in some sense superficial. That is, they do not learn about real features of the world, such as causal relations. And as such, deep learning is prone to getting things seriously wrong, as uh, the, its vulnerability to adversarial attacks suggests. So what can we do to reduce the risk of algorithms going astray in the healthcare uh, context? Well, there are at least two options. The first is to hold the algorithms fixed so that they would give the same results whenever they're provided with the same inputs. Or as the FDA puts it, 
used something called locked algorithms. By contrast, uh, adaptive algorithms are able to learn continuously, which means that for a given set of inputs, the outputs may change as the learning uh, process is updated. A second option is to hold the environment in which the algorithms operate fixed and allow for the use of adaptive algorithms. So for instance, take a, a next generation robotic surgeon. Suppose that we would like to use adaptive algorithms. Uh, we may be able to reduce the risk of the algorithms going astray by holding the environment in which uh, they operate fixed. So for, we might for, uh, be able to do this, for example, by allowing the robotic surgeon only to perform tasks that it can do with a high degree of accuracy, such as incision or suturing. But in many healthcare applications, it may be difficult to hold fixed the environment in which the algorithms operate, since many such applications involve the human organism, the life processes of which are in constant uh, flux and therefore difficult to hold fixed. So given this, it seems that the first option, locking the algorithm itself, may be preferable for many types of healthcare uh, research, uh, healthcare applications in the near term. Um, so earlier I mentioned that, you know, there are four types of algorithms. Uh, based on the ethical considerations we have identified, it seems that there are good reasons to use the locked algorithms, at least with respect to the first three types. So for example, suppose that a healthcare algorithm would be operating inside a human organism and be making its own decisions to ensure that the basic health and bodily integrity of patients remain, um, uh, remain uncompromised and they're not inadvertently harmed. It seems that other things being equal, there's a good reason to use algorithms that provide the same output whenever they're given the same input, i.e. locked algorithms. Likewise, there's a prima facie reason for using locked algorithms in cases where um, algorithms outside of the human organism would be making their own decisions, uh, since they could go against our values or cause harm without our being able to stop them. Similarly, in cases where the algorithms would simply assist human decision making, but would also do but would do so inside a human organism, there's also a prima facie reason to use locked algorithms since they could affect uh, the patient's basic health and bodily integrity. Now, as far as I can tell, the ethical considerations we have identified earlier do not seem to apply to type 4 algorithms, which uh, serve as mere inputs into human decision making and operate outside of the human organism. Now, this, of course, does not mean that there are not other ethical considerations that apply to type 4 algorithms. Okay. But even though we should use only locked algorithms, um, we, in these cases, type one to type three, we may still be able to take advantage of adaptive algorithms through what might be called staggered learning. So staggered learning involves uh, allowing adaptive algorithms uh, to learn and generate new input-output relations, but not apply that new learning synchronous, uh, synchronously. So once the uh, new connections between inputs and outputs have been verified and validated, uh, they could then be used to develop a new uh, updated locked algorithm. In this way, learning could still occur, but it would be done in steps. So I'll just conclude. So many private companies, governmental agencies, academic institutions have proposed ethical frameworks for AI, but they neither explain how uh, recommendations in their frameworks are justified, nor the means by which we might distinguish genuine ethical principles for, and those that are not genuine ethical principles. So in this talk, I've, I've argued that the fundamental conditions approach to human rights gives us a more unified and substantive AI ethics framework that can help us address these issues. In addition, I propose that the fundamental conditions approach offers a helpful framework for identifying distinct ethical considerations that companies and AI researchers uh, in healthcare might encounter and for explaining and justifying these ethical considerations. For instance, I showed that the fundamental conditions approach helps us to see that AI healthcare 
algorithms that operate inside the human organism could raise issues about basic health and bodily integrity and healthcare, healthcare algorithms that make decisions on their own uh, without human input could raise concerns that such algorithms could harm others without our being able to stop them. Since current iterations of deep learning learn superficially, I also propose that the fundamental conditions approach implies that many healthcare algorithms should be locked, at least uh, for now, but that we can still take advantage of adaptive algorithms through uh, staggered learning. So the fundamental conditions approach offers a novel and substantive ethical framework for research and application of AI in healthcare. And so I think it deserves to be investigated further in future discussions on this topic. Thank you very much. And I will stop broadcasting. Oops. Did I stop? There we go. Okay. Yeah, right. Real sound. Oh, thank you. Thanks. It's so weird uh, just talking to ether, <laughs> you know, sort of talk, talk to the screen, you can see people's well, faces. <laughs> we exist, really. You can come and uh, check yes. it out next time. <laughs> so so uh, we're open to questions, right, Matthew? Hopefully you'll mm -hmm. yep. be happy to hear. OK, yep. so Kyle, please. All right. Um, hi, and thank you, um, Matthew. I really enjoyed that. Um, I have what I assume is an annoying question, but that's okay, right? Um, We're philosophers. Oh, yeah, yeah, we specialize in that. That's our job. Okay, yeah. good, good, good. Um, so I'm curious about um, how the fundamental, I see how the fundamental conditions approach can justify uh, commitments or policies or, or rules. Um, but you also uh, pretty systematically would say just that it can justify or explain. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering how it can play, how it plays an explanatory role um, and what, what exactly it's explaining when it's not, when it's not sort of justifying a, a commitment. Oh, that's a good question. Um, so I was thinking that, um, um, like take, for example, um, you know, you want to use like a BCI inside the head, right? Sort of like a brain computer interface, like a healthcare application, you want to put it inside someone's body. And so then the thought is something like, well, uh, what are the things that we should be thinking about, right? Uh, and so the one worry is that this could impact someone's basic health and, um, uh, their uh, and sort of uh, their bodily integrity. So this would justify certain like treatments, right? Cert certain ways of, you know, doing certain things. Like we might put a limit, right? Or we might have certain restrictions, sort of go governmental regulations and so on and so forth. And I was thinking that this also explains like why those regulations would be in place, right? Like it both justify, like, so why do we have this, like, so, you can just imagine um, a different alternative where uh, the FDA just, so for example, the FDA has said something like, we should use locked algorithms uh, in medical devices. That, that I mean, you, it doesn't seem to explain, but they don't explain why. So if you actually go look it up, they don't say why we should use locked algorithms. And so we're kind of like, well, why, you know, like why should we use locked algorithms in these cases? So I, I was thinking that the, the, the two things, like, it both explains why we should use like sort of because we care about basic health, because we care about bodily integrity, but also it's a justification. Like, so some things could explain, but not justify, right? So, right, um, like the, you, you could have, I, I can't think of it at the moment, but you can have something that explains why the FDA. So, you know, the FDA says, well, the reason we want locked algorithms is because, you know, the pharmaceutical companies pay us a lot of money. Right. Um, so that explains why they want locked algorithms, you know, but it doesn't justify, you know, the locked algorithm. So I, I take it the two could come apart. So I, I don't know if that was helpful. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Herb has a question. 
Uh, yeah, uh, it was a great talk, Matt. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, what, it, it did not deal with one of what I consider the major problem with AI in medicine, and that is mm -hmm. uh, it's really a sort of a Trojan horse, or it, not, not by design, but it may be a Trojan horse for letting old-fashioned paternalism back into the back door, sort of. Mm -hmm. uh, be, the paternalism got its strength from the fact that the doctor really did know more than the patient mm -hmm. and used that uh, knowledge that he had it's almost as if the medical knowledge was the equivalent of a black box that the patient had no way of uh, uh, seeing whether it was justified or where it came from. And therefore he had to trust the, so we, we spent like the last 50 years of bioethics getting rid of that form of paternalism. Yeah. AI now presents itself as an equivalent black box, mm -hmm. which, you know, the, the, even the idea that you were talking about of locked algorithms, this is the equivalent of like you that a doctor has to practice evidence-based medicine. He can't use a treatment if there isn't a controlled clinical trial that proves that that works. Otherwise, he's a bad doctor. We don't want that. We want a sort of give and take, and we want the human being to make the decision for each patient. The so I'm I'm afraid that uh, artificial intelligence will allow because it's a black box necessarily because the it's simply too complex both for, for either the doctor or the patient to understand, much less explain to each other what's going on. Uh, so what, do you have any thoughts about this fear of, of it becoming powerful uh, and therefore the equivalent of a new form of paternalism? That's such a great question, Herb. And you know, actually, literally, there was a study that came out maybe about two weeks ago that um, you, apparently you can put a Trojan algorithm inside a black box and the researchers would not know it. So it, it's exactly what, I mean, literally what you're saying is true. You know, um, you, you can put anything inside the black box, like, but, you know, researchers, <laughs> like even the people who program them weren't able to tell because, you know, the thing is so opaque. Um, so you're absolutely right. And that's why, uh, and then, but, you know, more uh, directly on your point about paternalism. And that's why a lot of people are, you know, talking about how, you know, we need to make the black box more transparent. We need to be, to, you know, like the expectability and so on and so forth. I, so one of the things that I would say is that, uh, so, you know, I mentioned that the fundamental conditions approach can explain why human beings have, a, you know, the right to autonomy, like why autonomy is such an important value. And that value, I think, doesn't go away uh, even when we're using AI. So you know, patients need to be understand, uh, under, you know, they need to be able to understand sort of these technologies, they need to be able to consent, you know, voluntarily consent to these things. And so uh, hopefully some of these things, like at least some of these ethical, uh, you know, sort of borders with like these things will remain even in the context of AI, but there's a real danger. I mean, I just wanna also uh, say that uh, what you're saying uh, is uh, it's, it is a real danger because uh, just take cancer diagnosis, for example. So the IBM's Watson now does the sort of like the re like detecting cancer cells, like apparently around 97% accuracy or something like that. And at Sloan Kettering, they, they found, uh, they did a survey and they found that doctors and nurses were basically deferring to the AI algorithm without really understanding what's going on. They're in fact deferring and so it's kind of, it's like the issue that you're talking is real, um, so. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, Kenneth Berkowitz, question. Hi, uh, thanks, Matt. Again, a great talk, a great topic really made me think. Um, you know, what, what you just said made me think that, you know, even when I was an intern and you, you, you taught, when you get an EKG, and the EKG prints out with an interpretation, which basically is some artificial intelligence algorithm, right? Based on what it's seeing and measuring. The first thing the resident says is don't ever look at that, okay? So, you know, if people are looking at this stuff in a mindless way, until we can really trust it, which I don't, I've, I've gone from a trust and verify approach to like a zero trust and verify approach, um, which I think is, is served me better in a way. But a lot of what you talked about is um, about based in rights, okay? And this is where I argue from also. 
And I think it's a real risk if we um, take away people's fundamental rights to participate in these things. And you know, for those who don't know, I work for the Veterans Administration and our patients are more vulnerable than other patients in the sense that in many ways, we're the system of last resort. So it's not like a patient has a choice. So even if there's transparency and we say, if we give you this device, we're gonna use the data for X, Y, or Z beyond your care without giving them a choice. They don't have, they, they can't go somewhere else. So inherent in that will be, you know, bias and, and discrimination and all sorts of things we want to avoid. But other people have argued that you have to balance rights with responsibilities. Now, if nothing else, the pandemic has made me sort of rethink my concepts of what people in our society view as their rights versus their responsibilities. And I never would have dreamed that we would have controversy over like some of the most fundamental public health things as the duty to have a small inconvenience to protect others based on real science, I think. But that's clearly gotten politicized and is at best, I'll just say controversial. So what about people's responsibility to contribute to learning, which ultimately promotes everyone's right to health because AI, machine learning, everything doesn't work without the big data. So even though I've argued for respect, meaningful choice, transparency, all the things you talk about, learning new language to sort of defend it, which I really appreciate from you. But what do you say to someone who says, well, no, it's your responsibility to participate in this. And, and how do you balance your rights versus your responsibilities? And you didn't use the word altruism at all. So I'll throw that out. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's, that's a really great question, Ken. And so I think that, um, yeah, I, you know, it's a, it's a huge debate about what our responsibilities are to, for example, to, to promote public health. I, I, I think what I like about the, uh, the human rights framework is that uh, at, at least, um, you know, I think Carol shares this view as well, but I think that, you know, um, human rights apply to everybody. And so that means that we all have a duty to uphold human rights. Um, and what that means is that, so we have, a res we have, we have collective responsibility to make sure that uh, rights are pr protected and promoted. Um, and that means, for example, just take, you know, the pandemic, uh, even if people can't force us, you know, like, so we have a right to bodily integrity. So, you know, people shouldn't like come and stick a needle in my uh, arm, at least, like under ordinary circumstances, um, that doesn't mean, so in my view, you may still have a duty to uh, take vaccine, like be vaccinated yourself for the sake of others, right? And I think that that's the nice thing about the, the uh, my view about the, uh, in, in my view, the human rights framework is it allows that kind of conversation about sort of duty to self, your duty, you know, you have a duty to sort of get vaccinated yourself in order to protect others. Um, and so uh, I think uh, there are there, there will be responsibilities. I will have to look at it on a case by case basis. Um, there are sort of, I mean, one of the questions which I don't explore in the talk is something like, well, look, uh, so if you do have the duty to public health, do you have a duty to provide um, your healthcare information so that you know we can kind of improve these algorithms and so on and so forth. And how, how do we think about that in relation to say your right to privacy? Um, and so that's a very important topic and it's you know something that I don't address here, but that's but I think that those are the conversations that we do need to have. You know, if you you know take this framework seriously, then uh, that's that's exactly what we need to be thinking about. So, so can I just press a little bit more? If, if you think that there's a fundamental right to health, okay? Mm -hmm. Is that fundamental right to health extend to um, the health of the population? Because what we're talking about in AI is collective learning. And, that, and, and is, is your fundamental right to health exclusive to an individual? Or is there a societal right to advancement and innovation and knowledge when it comes to health? 
Because if so, then you lose individual rights along the way. And I can't believe I'm even saying this, but how do I respond to people who say that when I always argue for the individual right? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I mean, so, so uh, you know, that's a really good question. And so I guess I, I would want to hear more. So what, like, so like you, I think, you know, individual rights are very important. Uh, but I think, so like, is it not enough to get us a lot of these public health measures, like sort of, you know, the fact that you have a human right to health is a reason why I should make sure that I get vaccinated so that I don't harm you, right? Um, and if that's the case, we already, that's already the beginning of um, the, 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 the right to, you know, health can be grounded in individuals, your right, right? But it can extend to a bunch of people, like the duties can sort of, it's something that's applicable to like all of us, right? Like all the all those people who are capable of get, getting vaccinated should get vaccinated, right? Because uh, we're all protecting your right, but each other's rights, in, you know? In our, so we have rights, but we also have responsibilities. But I take it, I, I mean, I guess, um, so on that view, uh, the rights are still grounded in individuals, but the duties may, you know, that duty may apply to a, a lot of people. So do you have a duty then to contribute your data to machine learning? So uh, that part is less clear. So that, you know, that's something that we need to explore. So in, that, in this case, for example, I mean, you know, it goes up against sort of like the right to privacy and all these other stuff. But I would say that, um, um, and, and also the question of trust, like, can we trust uh, a company who's collecting the data? Are they going to use it respons res responsibly? And so on and so forth, right? So if you have like an ideal system where really the data is being collected, so that it's gonna like you know maybe we're, we live in Iceland, you know where they have like big data and big you know bio banks and stuff like that, and where they maybe they do use the data responsibly and so on and so forth. Maybe in that context, you do have a duty to provide you know healthcare information. And also, by the way, they have uh, they have universal healthcare, right? So in the, in the in the in the in a situation where um, you're guaranteed to have your healthcare needs taken care of. You don't have to worry as much about giving away your information. Or and also in that, uh, in Iceland, uh, I, I take it presumably that there's not like big ph pharma interests where they sort of might use the data against you or sort of uh, stop you from getting jobs and so on and so forth. So you know a lot of conditions. So I can imagine that. You know, a, a lot of conditions would have to be satisfied, you know, for that to, you know, for that to happen. So. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll, yeah. Carol, you want to say something? <laughs> I, uh, not, uh, later. Uh, <laughs> let me hear from, uh, by the way, do any of the philosophers want to chime in here, especially the students? Yeah. Callum, any thoughts? Alice, questions? No? Okay, I'll call on Hugo then. Oh yeah, wait, 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 sorry, Hugo. Alice, the students always get deferred. This is, this is quite a quick question and um, I'm sorry if you covered it because the internet hasn't been brilliant. Um, but I was wondering what the sort of, um, consent on the side of the like patients is like um so whether um whether there are like whether there's different ways that you need to like get consent from a patient to use these ai devices or whether it's just kind of like um because i remember reading somewhere that they're beginning to integrate um like sort of ai in surgery and they were debating over whether to have this as an added Thing that a patient has to sign like that they're okay with um with their surgery being performed by partially by like a non-human agent um and i'm just wondering if you had any thoughts on that yeah that's a great question so a lot of like i mean i mentioned some uh like current iterations of robotic surgeons they use um 
uh, sort of symbolic AI. So basically, they're if then they don't they actually don't use uh, black box you know algorithms and things like that. So it's very uh, so in those cases, it's pretty transparent and you know. Um, the, it's no different than a complex search, like surgical machine, or you know, when you go into the, um, you know, the 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 you know the doctor's office and they're doing something, they you know they can explain that to you, or at least in principle, you know, it's it's uh, it's interpretable, understandable, and so on and so forth. Um, so I was thinking in this uh, in the paper, but they're you know talking about the next generation robotic surgeons where they want to use uh, adaptive algorithms. That's what the FDI, FDA is considering right now and so on and so forth. Things like, you know, take like a, as an analogy, self-driving cars, right? You know, um, so where it's more adaptive, they're learning on the fly and so on and so forth. And so right, as far as I'm aware right now, the healthcare ap applications, they're not, they're not using adaptive algorithms. Uh, so that doesn't, arise uh, yet, but it's going to come. And that's where they want to head it. They, they're headed, uh, they head it uh, in that direction because of course, with adaptive algorithms, you can do more and it's possibly more accurate, but it's also less uh, understandable and so on and so forth. So, yeah. Okay, I have a really quick follow-up. Um, sure. Yeah. So with, um, then where would the sort of culpability, so obviously, um, we don't know a huge amount about this, but there's certain like negligence, like legal things that can be, um, you know, yeah. to mess stuff in a certain, is there, yeah. is there any sort of like um, indication of how sort of culpability in that sense uh, is going to go for, for these, or is it just maybe something that's like undetermined yet? No, <laughs> so that's, that's actually an active, that's a great question and it's an active debate. So it's, it's, it goes under the heading of accountability, like who should be accountable when, uh, I don't know, when the robot, you know, the next generation robotic surge, surgeon goes wrong or who should be accountable when a self-driving car goes, you know, like hit somebody, right? Uh, should it be, is it the programmer? Is it the company? Is it the person who's in the car but not driving? <laughs> Right and so on and so forth. And is it sort of a dispersed uh, responsibility? Is it sort of like all of the above, or is it some portion of like some of the people? And so that that's where they're trying to. Uh, there, there's actually a lot of discussion about this. Um, one thought that I have. So the, I think the human rights approach helps a bit with that question, which is that you might think accountability belongs to everybody like who is in a position to do something about it. So you, you might think, look, if, you know, if the company is, uh, if Tesla is sort of like sending out cars that are not fully ready for uh, full autonomy, then the company itself is responsible. If the AI researcher knows that it just put together this algorithm, but it's got like, it can't handle, so for example, uh, right now, uh, it turns out that there are these stop, there are these stop signs, right? Sort of like uh, self-driving cars. If you just put a banana sticker on the stop sign, it won't recognize the stop sign. Like it's as simple as that to stop it from functioning. And so, if you are uh, a programmer and you know that your algorithm is vulnerable to that that type of thing, then you're you bear some responsibility when the car crashes, you know, like kills, you know, like gets into an accident. And, and so, uh, and the nice thing about the human rights framework is I think that it says that, look, there can be a lot of people who can be responsible and then we can talk about who should be most responsible and so on and so forth, yeah. Great, good question. Callum, anything? Um, I, I, I don't know if this will be helpful, but I, I had a little question that came off the back of um, uh, the back and forth you had with Ken. Um, uh, in that, uh, uh, your response to something Ken said, you, uh, you, you implied that these, these rights are sort of grounding duties on the parts of others. I think the example you had was my right to health grounds your duty to get vaccinated um, in in certain contexts, and I I had a vague thought about the extent to which those duties are enforceable. Um, on the one hand, 
I want I want some of them to be enforceable, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, uh, but but uh, at the same time, uh, we might have worries that if all of the duties that get grounded by these rights are enforceable, um, then my right to health is gonna suddenly license me to do all kinds of things to force you to do stuff that is required for me to, to, to remain healthy. And maybe the vaccination example is like a, a gray area um, about whether or not it's legitimate for me to force you against your will to get vaccinated if, if that's a requirement for me to fulfill my, my, my right to health. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that's that's a secondhand uh, smoke is a is a is a less controversial example. Right. Yeah. Nice. What's the example? Sorry, Ken. Secondhand second smoke. Oh, secondhand smoke. Yeah. 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 Good. Yeah. So you know, as I mentioned, the stuff about vaccination, we also have a right to bodily integrity, and that means that you know people shouldn't just go around and sort of jabbing other people without their consent. You know. So you so uh, and so the. I was uh, trying to create a space uh, for the conversation where we could have a duty without it being enforced um, in the case of vaccination where, you know, I, uh, you know, even if I am perfectly healthy and I think I'm not gonna, um, you know, I won't really be at risk of COVID if I were to catch it and so on and so forth. I may have the responsibility to get myself vaccinated in case I give the, you know, the COVID to, you know, my grandmother or to somebody, my neighbor and so on and so forth, right? It doesn't follow um, that, therefore I think other people have the right to jab me, right? So, and so that's the, and, and yeah. And so that's a very nice, so uh, sometimes we think, oh, if, if somebody has the, you know, if I have the duty, then other people can, do certain things to me, but this creates a not, like a space where maybe that's not true, you know, and that's kind of interesting. Um, and I think that's sort of a underappreciated. So, you know, I, I think you're, what you're saying is exactly what people worry about, but I think that uh, there, maybe we have enough um, philosophical tools to be able to open up that space where the two, they're not, you know, they don't come hand in hand, so to speak. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And also, you'd have to add a domain of institutions also that has been left out of this. It's not as though we each, uh, you know, have, have a duty on our own to fulfill everybody else's human rights, because that would be impossible. So it's to support, you know, to uh, su engender and support institutions that would do it. So, but yeah, we'll come back to that. Um, I have a few philosophical questions, but I'm going to wait af after Hugo's more undoubtedly practical one. Uh, hi, uh, there's a great talk. You raise a lot of important issues. I'm glad you brought up institutions, Carol, because uh, one of the things that I was going to talk about is that it's been in the last 50 years or perhaps longer, that, as you can imagine, one of the trends has been for corporations to push responsibility for their actions onto individuals. It's been a corporate strategy in which you're responsible for what you're doing and freeing them from responsibility. If I offer uh, AI assisted diagnosis to a doctor and I'm a corporation and I don't really know how it works because it's a neural network learning box, do I have a responsibility for that decision that the doctor makes using, does the corporation responsible, is Tesla responsible? You know, you're talking about multiple responsibilities, but that begs the question I think of what is the, what is the responsibility of knowing? You talk about, you can't explain post hoc because you're going to just find some kind of a justification for a rationale or suggestion that the AI is making because you don't understand why it made it. But I'd suggest that one of the big uses of massive amounts of data and computational ability is the ability to find surprise connections that you would not make normally. So are you stunting the ability of the, that AI to work effectively? If you demand understanding, and if you don't demand understanding, where's the legal and moral responsibility lie in the individual who takes the suggestions or the one who produces the suggestion? 
Yeah, great question. So on the first point, uh, I totally agree with you. Like, that's why I said Tesla is also responsible and Tesla is the company, you know. So, you know, we can say Elon Musk is responsible, the researchers. But um, and Carol's absolutely right that when I think about the human rights framework, I mean that it applies to everybody. And, and, and as well as the institutions and the government and so on and so forth, anybody that can facilitate or the hospitals, right? Uh, and so on and so forth. So, you know, so I think uh, that is a, um, and I think I see that as, you know, sort of a nice thing about the human rights framework is that we can sort of in advance say, look, uh, people who are able to do uh, or institutions or whatever that are able to affect the change are, you know, should, do you know like they they have a duty to do certain things? Um, so on the second point, um, uh, so it's it's a question about. Um, sorry, remind me the second um, knowledge about knowledge. How much you know? How, how is it important to under? You oh, said yeah, yeah. good. Nobody knew how aspirin yeah. worked. Yeah, good. Aspirin for two hundred years, right? To people. Yeah. So so the the so yeah so we don't want to stunt. Uh, you know, some of these AI algorithms, they could actually do better than us, right? And so in that way, they could help a lot of patients. But at the same time, some of them are black boxes. And so that could also cause problems, right? So where, you know, where do we draw the line? And, or like, how should we navigate, you know, those two different things? And so one of the things I suggested was that we can have something called staggered learning, right? So staggered learning is where we, uh, so, we use locked algorithms right now, but while we're using locked algorithms, we could also use adaptive algorithms to be learning on the fly from the data that we collect, right? And then uh, in the next iteration, once you so once you you're, you're able to uh, do you know sort of randomized control trials on the that set of new data that you've collected, right? Then that new set of data become uh, can become fixed, right? They become locked again. And so, so then you can use that new set, you know, like you can sort of uh, uh, benefit from the new uh, locked algorithm in order to sort of benefit from this new technology. So there will be a delay in terms of, you know, new data and our, uh, our you know, use of the new data. Um, and I think that's justified because, um, the black learning itself is, you know, like we don't really know, understand it. Yes, it could help us, but uh, at the same time, if you just look at all the adversarial attacks, and if you look at the Trojan horse, and so on and so forth, it could also go very, uh, very wrong as well. And so, for those reasons, I sort of favor a staggered approach. So. I, I just have to add one thing. I know that Kim's sure. going to stand up again. I know several companies right now that are developing basically artificial biological holographic sets that are being used to test drugs so that they do not have to test them on living creatures mm -hmm. uh, or mice or volunteers at terminal you know, state of life or something like that, but are creating artificial environments that simulate the human body that are looking at what the reaction should be if you add you know, MDNA, viral institutions and so forth. Can we test drugs using artificial means on artificial life forms and then apply them to humans? I, if that's a big involved answer, I don't wanna take all the time, but um, that's really the next phase of concern, I think. Yeah, and the short answer is uh, we're, headed, we're headed that way. I'm actually an advisor for Google DeepMind on their AlphaFold um, sort of uh, projects where they're creating, they're using proteomics, you know, they're basically using machine learning to generate proteomics, you know, models that they can be used to test drugs. So, yeah, oh, so, so, so yeah. We make robots to test drugs. <laughs> are they going to have rights that are being violated because we're using no. them? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if they're right. conscious, if they're if you, if they're conscious, yeah. So since people with hands up have already asked, I'm going to just um, uh, what would you say to the problem somebody might raise that your notion of the good life is kind of a black box? Oh, uh, nice, nice. You no, know, just in the sense that I mean our approaches are very similar. I'm also into the conditions, you know, human yeah. rights as specifying conditions. Yeah. But the difference is I don't operate with the notion of a good life. 
um, but rather, you know, equal positive freedom, uh, rights to self-development, and also to the base. So the, the issue would be, do you differentiate among, is there any differentiation among your set of human rights or are they, I mean, you're in line with the Universal Declaration, the equal primordial primordiality of all human rights, but the problem there is that they can conflict and that some are obviously more important than others. How do you address that in your uh, theoretically, just in brief, would be one question. Um, and I have a way of distinguishing between uh, conditions for life activity, basic life activity, and for its further flourishing um, and making a distinction between primary and secondary human rights. Mm -hmm. But anyway, aside from that, I just also was curious when you talked about harm. Mm -hmm. Did you mean harm to others' human rights, or are you adding in some kind of consequentialist addition to your theory? No, first it was the first. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, I guess just one, also one th final thought would be that um, you could have said perhaps to uh, Kenneth's concern. Well, it was just that some issues could be more, you might have a moral duty without it being necessarily uh, a, a, a matter of rights mm. so anyway those are just some thoughts if you want yeah. to just priority thing briefly yeah that's or the conflict yeah. priority yeah. and conflict yeah so no thank thanks for that Kara. and the third point i completely agree yeah so you know there could also be duties without rights you know sort of this is like um uh, there's a um you know, like you might think that you have a duty to pay um, uh, not free ride on buses, you know, sort of right, right, without right. anybody having a right <laughs> against or you. Or not, not to lie. lie. I mean, yeah, yeah, some yeah, more yeah, generally. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's, that's so Carol's absolutely, absolutely right. I skipped when I was talking, I skipped ahead and say what, uh, uh, what good life amounts to. So uh, and then I was trying to circle back, but I don't think I, you know, like, okay. uh, do a good. so the good life is, uh, as I understand it, is one spent pursuing basic activities. And the basic activities are things like depersonal relationships, knowledge, active pleasures, and passive pleasure. It's basically a kind of objective list type thing. Um, and, but uh, what we have a right to are not those things but the fundamental conditions for pursuing those things. So, you know, and then we can talk about whether that makes sense or, you know, why, et cetera, et cetera. But so, so uh, it was a bit of a black box in my talk, but, but it's no, not- No, but even in general, different. I yeah, mean, or else if you fill it in, you're in danger of, you know, an essentialist, yeah. uh, an essentialist list. I'm afraid I hear, I hear yeah. a more misbound yeah, list. Yeah. And, and that, I think that's where I was happy to, I think there are certain things like, like, so take like the, so um, I'm happy for that list to kind of change, but like the fundamental conditions. So take, for example, the capacity to be able to think. Seems like all of us need the capacity to be able to think in order to pursue a good life, right? Mm -hmm. And so we can all agree, whatever else we might agree about what we want to do, the value, et cetera, et cetera. We need to be able to like think, to be able to uh, have autonomy, to have liberty and so on and so forth. So, so the general idea is that that's what we have a right to is sort of these things, um, you know, these fundamental capacities to be able to do these type of things. So that's so that that's, that's roughly the, the move. Um, and then, uh, and then Carol asks about, well, well, how do you, what happens when rights conflict? Uh, and there, I don't say very much about that. I think that it's a complicated story. Um, you know, there's an easy, some, some people have an easy, like, uh, uh, you know, Gerworth has this idea that, look, it's whatever you, it's most needed for action or something like that, you know. And, but I, I don't think that's true. Like, sort of uh, just take like, uh, so the idea, so if you take that view, you think, well, life is the most important, right? So lo life trumps everybody, uh, everything, all the other values. But in fact, uh, in public health, in public policy, we trade uh, lives for other things. Like, so we, you know, like in New York right now, we could build yet another hospital and that'll probably save a couple more lives, right? But as a matter of public policy, we don't do that. We also invest money in museums, for example, right? We invest money in playgrounds, right? And so on and so forth. And so, 
uh, I think uh, there's a, it, it's a bit more complicated than, you know, sort of just life trumps, you know, everything. And then, you know, like you have a hierarchy of different things, um, but it gets very complicated. And so I, I um, don't have a full, uh, fully worked out story. I think that's one of the difficult, uh, the, you know, one of the most challenging uh, things against sort of rights theories, you know, what happens rights when rights conflict. Uh, I mean, it's in some ways, um, you might think consequentialists also have that problem. I mean, they in, in one sense, they don't, they just sort of say, well, whatever maximizes the greatest consequence, that's what you should do. But, you know, that's the criteria of rightness, but in terms of decision procedure, like you don't actually know, like when does it, you know, like they, they also have a conflict, but it's, you know, it's like, they can't tell you exactly when it gets resolved. So, um, but, but that's not, uh, but Carol might have a better answer on this, in which case yeah, I would defer you, to sir. Carol. Very, <laughs> so. very charming. Uh, could I say one more thing to sure. Ken's point about when people yeah. are claiming that they have, that, you know, this whole freedom talk, what they mean is what the ancients called license which is the right, just the right to do whatever you please. And that can't be the meaning of freedom because freedom has to be an equal freedom of every, you know, as a, the advantage of the human rights approach is that it's equal. Everybody equally has these human rights. So you don't have the right to infringe the possibles, possibilities of freedom of others, which is what these people are doing. And anyway, they just mean license. They just mean doing whatever they please. And nobody thinks that's the meaning of liberty even let alone freedom. Okay, anyway, so let me call on Herb first and then Ken again. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't think Herb put his hand down last time. <laughs> oh, I actually did lower it and he raised it again. Oh, it, <laughs> uh, it was a, a response to, it doesn't have to be either or, uh, personal or communal. Uh, and the the idea, of, we, we get hung up in the priority of individual autonomy doesn't mean that individual autonomy trumps everything. Uh, and I think recognizing that, it, that it's a continuum rather than an all or nothing individual autonomy, I think gets you out of some of this conflict between the public good and the, uh, uh, the individual good. Uh, and where everybody's uncomfortable with a continuum because we wanna have you know, a red light and a green light and know exactly where we stand. And that's not the way life is. I just want to comment yeah, that. All right, yeah. do whatever you please. Anyway, all right, Kenneth. Kenneth. So um, again, great conversation. Um, Hugo, you should look up um, um, synthetic data, which is an intermediary between what you were talking about and what's happening now, but it's a trend. Um, Matt, where do you think the oversight of AI should be? Because for research, we have enough oversight with IRBs and approvals and accountability that people for the most part have come sort of to trust it. Mm -hmm. But AI is outside the traditional oversight of research. Much of it's done under the guise of quality improvement. Mm -hmm. There's all sorts of borrowing because we talked about healthcare, but now under the sort of guise of health and healthcare, people are, are using um, other publicly available data in almost a surveillance way, um, geospatial data, what neighborhoods you hang out, is your phone in a bar a lot, mm -hmm. have you bought a gun, which is another publicly available data set, um, is your GPA fall, falling, is your FICO score falling, um, do you live in a bad neighborhood, and you, they draw inferences about health, and then they apply that to your health data. So I don't think there's any such thing anymore as health data versus just your overall data, which again, then that data isn't protected under the traditional protections of health data, HIPAA and Privacy Act and all those other things like that. Mm -hmm. So I've argued that we need to have an ethics framework for how this is evaluated. We can't rely on the laws. We can't rely on the rules. It's unfathomable as technology improves where this goes. What's the oversight? We don't have structures and processes for oversight. It's crazy. Yeah, that's a great question, Ken. And that's sort of exactly uh, people in this space are uh, like what they're trying to figure out right now. And so, you know, we have uh, 
you know, on the one hand, data from your, you know, your Apple Watch, and on the other hand, data and yours because I won't get one because of the data. No, I don't have one either because <laughs> I, I, I don't get one for exactly the same like privacy reasons and all these other stuff. You know, I don't need uh, uh, Apple to be collecting information about me. But um, but uh, and then on the other hand, sort of more things that are closer to medical devices, where it's sort of uh, you know, like uh, they're more like traditional medical technologies, right? Where it's inside your organism, et cetera, et cetera. And so one of the things that I wanted to suggest was that, well, you know, you could think, well, look, this is all just data. They're all like health information. And in a sense, in some sense they are, but I, I what, what, one of the things I try to do with the human rights, the fundamental conditions approach is to say that data, they come in different forms and they're, they have different sources and they raise distinct ethical issues. And so if we just treat them all as lump of data, that we might not, we might be obfuscating the issues like different, that we might be conflating different types of issues. And so for example, at something like a device that's in your body uh, that's collecting information about your blood and you know whatever, that might raise different information than something that monitors your social media activity possibly, right? And also if it sort of interferes with like, if this smart pill is like dispersing drugs and things like that, like it's collecting information in real time and then it's dispersing, you know, that, that uh, in a way that where it can kind of interfere, it's that uh, interfere with your sort of like organismic functions, that's slightly different, you know, from, you know, the stuff like that's just sort of like your, what your Apple Watch is doing. And so, uh, we need to have a more differentiated talk about this, these different types of data and sort of figure out where the sources of concerns are. And then begin, we need to start sort of segmenting, segmenting them and sort of think, okay, so if, it's, if, if this is going to act like medicine, then we need to treat it like medicine. And maybe the FDA should be regulating <laughs> like, you know, these things that are like inside your body that are gonna be like regular pills and stuff like that, et cetera, et cetera. And they need to really understand the algorithms behind that. And it can't just be the wow, wow West where, you know, like companies can just go in and, you know, whatever, you know, versus another data like Apple Watch where they sort of tell you, you know, how many steps you've taken, you know, today and et cetera, et cetera. Well, that's more diagnostic and more sort of whatever. And they raised other concerns. I mean, you know, they could track your, they could sort of infringe on your civil liberties and stuff like that, you know, but that's, you know, like once we see that type of data, raises sort of different types of issues and we can deal with those type of things. And so that's where I think the conversation should head it. Right now it's not. Right now there's a big lump and just sort of say, you know, we need regulation of all, like just, we just need to regulate this data, but there's no segment uh, segmentation. And I, that seems to me to be yeah. not that good of a way. I, yeah. Can yeah. I Carol, add one yeah. thing to that, Carol? Briefly, yeah. then I'll be quiet. Yeah. If you're going to parse data like that, I agree. I would you take it to the next level and parse the non-traditional health data, like your geospatial data, your social media data, your um, you know um, FICO score and things, and decide when it's okay to use that for health. Mm. And because it's not just what you think of as health data, when can you take that other data? and use that um, and apply it to the health uh, conclusions? Because I think that's a huge question. Because to me, that amounts to surveillance. Yeah. When, when are we able to happen. surveil yeah. a whole person to yeah. draw implications about their health or population health? Yeah. So I think now, by the way. Yeah, and just quick, quick comment on that, which is really important, Ken, which is that, you know, the social determinants of health, like it turns out that your zip code <laughs> <laughs> tells a lot about your health, right? And so, you know, so we need to, you know, I, I think we uh, we need to do more, like we need to know that and that they're, I mean, of course they're correlational, but they're very, they're strongly correlated, right? And so that, you know, so it turns out that certain type of information that are uh, their sort of public health information, they're, they, they're actually relevant to your health, so yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I, I totally agree with that. So Carol, go ahead. Just, yeah. I, I, just internal to your uh, typology, a question yeah. about um, it just, first of all, it's great that you are establishing some of those uh, categories 
and they could be added to, I'm sure, in interesting ways. But I'm a little bit worried about the inside and outside the body thing. Yep. Because yep. one can easily imagine a, a device that can harm the body from outside. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, isn't that, in fact, a division? Yeah. Uh, whether, I mean, certainly it violate, you can, the, the worst case would be violating bodily integrity straight yes. out, but actually harming the body. Yeah. Um, by, you know, some kind of device that is yeah. turned toward yeah. it. Um, why, where does that fit? It's outside. Yeah. It's yeah. So that's a great question. So, you know, there are sort of things that like, you know, um, so we also have, um, um, you know, the aviation FAA, <laughs> Right. Yeah, no, I'm just uh, saying you need a or, category for that. It's, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. yeah. Within yeah. your categories. Yeah. So um, I think uh, uh, there, uh, and this comes down to sort of their different sources of harm, right? You can be harmed because this certain things disrupts your organismic functions on the inside, right? right. Say it sort of lowers your uh, blood sugar level, and as a result, you know, like certain things happen, right? right? Versus you, you know, like this thing. The, the robotic surgeon just cuts your arm off, right? That's, that's a, yeah. And then, you know, so, um, and we need to regulate both things and there are different types of harm. And, but I, I guess one thing that I wanted to say was that they've re, they're sort of, uh, I guess they're different sources of harm and we need to be thinking about them. Uh, we need to kind of deal with them as they sort of like, you know, like where they're coming from so that we can sort of among, figure out like what- your external yeah. devices though, there would seem to be two types. Uh, yeah. One that is like detecting something without harming you. And the other is something that could be trained on you and would harm you. Yeah, that's right. Or being trained on you. It's just a- Yeah. But, but Carol, the other devices that don't harm you can generate information that can harm you. Yes, I agree completely yeah, with yeah, that. Yeah. And I, I, you know, this been this issue of surveillance and surveillance capitalism. Yeah. I was at a meeting with meta people who are yeah. working on it. So that yeah. was interesting, claiming to be working on it, blah, blah. But sometimes the, uh, I just wanted to say that the harm from social media can sometimes be worse than something that's put in your body because oh, yeah. <laughs> it hurts your feelings much more. Yes. <laughs> anyway, yep. I guess I guess we should really uh, just um, let you go at this point. I know uh, you have a family life and everything. Um, <laughs> this has been absolutely great. And um, I really, I learned a lot from it. And it's a very, very worthwhile project. Um, so please join me in thanking Matthew. Oh, thank you. Thank you all. And